This was an article published in the Wall Street Journal a few days back, and it went viral. We all very nearly know that it is not just good morning messages that we Indians have gone crazy for with the newfound love of groups. So what has happened all of a sudden? Why now? I mean, we Indians have had this affection for large communities since forever, right? A large families, large set of friends, large set of alumni, large set of friends from work. No wonder our wedding list crosses a thousand mark. Forget about even hundreds. Talk about it to a European and see the reaction that he will get. Over a thousand members <laughs> attending a wedding. I have spent most of my career working on communities, researching, studying, doing whatever it takes to make them work. And what I've come to realize is that as much as we think that a good community constitutes of members who are great at social skills, it is a science too, backed by several researchers, by well-known researchers. What has started happening is that companies have now started picking up this science and now architecting their platforms, communities, in such a way that the principles of this science be met so that the chances of success of groups is automatically higher. And WhatsApp, for one, is running on the forefront here. When WhatsApp groups launched, one of my classmates from school initiated a group for my batch. We were so excited about it. Hey, finally we are gonna get together and all of that. 30 odd members joined the same group. Now the guy who started the group was receiving all kind of praises and all. A little background here, I come from a boys only school, having two sections, commerce section, the more notorious ones, the science section, the more studious ones. And this guy was from a commerce section, the more notorious one. What he started doing was then, while adding people to the group, he was taking decisions at his own discretion. He was welcoming the guys who were more notorious and was not so reciprocated to the guys who were more studious. And no wonder that group fell apart in just a matter of time. What the group didn't realize at that time was, it was missing the founding principle of a strong community. Boundary. I believe there are five principles that needs to be established until you say that you have reached a sense of community amongst a group of people. And the base principle here is boundary. You need to clearly define what is the definition of membership for a group. And this, this theory of this five principle is not just based on our understandings, it is much derived from well-produced research notes, much of, which, much, uh, much of it is inspired by Dr. McMillan's research on a sense of community. To give you how important boundary is, I'll cite you an example. There's a company called Nextdoor in US which operates neighborhood social networks. Now what this company does is, as soon as a new network is created for one neighborhood, it asks the admin to draw the boundary of the neighborhood, to clearly define who will fell inside your group and who will not. To take it further, they send a postcard to every new member who's trying to join to verify the address so that to ensure that the right member is joining the group. Imagine, they spend multiple dollars for every user that they sign up. And I'm not even talking about the acquisition cost or the logistics. I'm just talking about the onboarding cost that they bear for each user. A lot of people make fun of it, debate, about this strategy, but only a few people understand that these guys are going scientifically about building this community and realize what needs to be done. So anyways, coming back to my classmates' WhatsApp group, our first experiment was an utter failure. So we thought, let's give it one more try. And we started another group. This time, a noble soul came up with the idea that let's award the admin access to every member whom we'll join. So everyone will feel equal about it, will have equal control, and it might just work. And it did. 55 odd members were subscribed to it, and the group was going decently well. <coughs> what then happened was, one guy posted a forwarded joke. All right, that's one joke, I can manage that. In a day or two, one other guy posted a forwarded joke. It's okay, once in a while. 
And one guy got too excited and posted about 15 to 20 odd messages at the same go. Tan, 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 tan. And it really ticked all of us out. And at that time, we realized that while giving admin powers to everyone, while we were thinking that everyone will have power to control who joins, everyone also gets the power to kick out someone. <laughs> so one guy came forward and kicked out all the three guys who had sent forwarded messages. And then the usual debate started, should we allow forwarded messages in the group or not? I'm sure you must have seen it somewhere or the other. Blah, 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 blah. Things were cooled down. People who were kicked out were added back. But the group was never the same. It became dull. We started thinking twice while posting anything, whether this will be spam, whether people will disrespect me in front of everyone. What it did was, it made me feel emotionally unsecure in that group. 80 to 90% groups fail here. They fail to make people feel that they belong here. They are accepted in this group and that they can feel free to express their thoughts in the most intimate fashions. And even if I disagree to your thoughts, I would still respect you. Have you ever wondered why family groups are more successful than the other groups that you join? I'll give you one example. This is a screenshot of a family group of a friend where this family believes in a temple far away from where they live. And the Pandit is a known friend of his dad. And the Pandit sends a picture of the Aarti happening there every day to his dad. And his dad posts the picture on the group. And then everyone pays their regards. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is our generation, right? We would come out saying that, where's the logic in it? What's the sense in it? but we never go ahead and post it in the group because they are family. We respect them. We respect their point of view. Imagine if we start respecting each other in other communities also. We start building that environment that I can freely come and communicate with the community. The level the community will reach to. Let's say we did that. And we have completed half the marathon of exercise of establishing a powerful community. It's still undone. You have to get your members invested in the community. It could be paying the membership fees. It could be giving back by time. It could be giving back by resources. My dad's walking morning walk group expects him to be for their walking you know, discussions at least four to five times a week. My poker group expects me to at least turn up once a month. Facebook ex expects you to add friends. LinkedIn expects you to keep your profile updated. Every successful community around you, if you notice, has something that they are making you invest in. You need to make you feel invested and feel that they too own the group. They have something to lose if they're not a part of this group. Now, I've been talking about next door, one of the better community managers that I've seen, what they do is, for them, getting people onto the platform in itself is a huge investment. Because I do not know the name of the person who's living two houses down the road. So for them, they promote it that send free postcard invitations, they write the content in such a manner that you feel free. They provoke you to invest in the community and bring the neighborhood together because there is value in having a safer and a better neighborhood. So that is the investment next door is looking out for. While we were being, building the mentorship program at, you know, between alumni and students, what we, we, we too came across a beautiful phenomenon. Um, as soon as we started building out the program, the first thing that comes to anybody's mind is, for a mentorship program between students and alumni, is that you'll get the subject experts from alumni to sign up as a mentor, tell them, tell Liz that you know, this is the amount of time I want to dedicate, and this is the area where I can help, and then get students to reach out to them for help. This model has been tried and tested by various companies, various platforms, various channels. It just doesn't work out. We reverse that cycle. We got the mentees to list themselves and clearly state what kind of help they are looking for. But write it in a way, present it in a way, that the alums feel that they're giving back to the community. They are investing in the community. And it worked. It beautifully worked. Our results were amazing. Now, 
someone might be thinking i've been talking about boundaries emotional security investment dude where's the benefits i join groups a lot of groups because i think i can benefit from that group and you're not even talking about that i received one such invitation for a linkedin group called khandelwal professionals me being a khandelwal at least thankfully they thought i am a professional to they invited me to this group and the about section says that this group is to network all the khandelwal professionals so that everyone benefits from it yeah sure some people got excited they came in and straight away started you know mentioning contacts and asking for referrals and sort of networking was happening the soul was missing this cannot last it will end the fact of the matter is that benefits is an intrinsic value it comes automatically all you have to do is establish the first three principles once you do that people will themselves figure out ways to benefit from each other to trade from each other my dad's morning walk groups is a place where he gets the best news updates the most relevant for them my poker group is the place where i've started getting referrals for the opportunities job opportunities that is open in my company people will themselves figure out ways do not even worry about making features if you are driving a community that's the last thing that you should th think about the benefits all you need to do is get the soul of the community working but even if you do that you will have a working community which is going fine but how do you get that to be sustainable over a period of time maybe forever you need to start building traditions you need to build glorified events that will bring the community back together over a period of time again and again and again every successful community around you the family has birthdays anniversaries ceremonies indian community have republic day independence day a school has an annual day we might at maika have a tedx event but you need to start building tradition so that this happens again and again one very good example of where this is not happening is tinder a very popular app amongst our generation right we create a profile we make a few right swipes we even get some matches we probably meet a few of them like somebody even start dating and then we come out of that of course there are some people who will still stay there continue but let's keep these guys aside it's a transaction and once a transaction is then you are out of it so tinder will never ever in its current form become a community of people looking to find people to date if the way i see is the world is a part is is built with small communities starting right from my immediate family to an extended family to my close friends large set of friends my classmates my alumni people from the same city people from the same country asians all the way up to the world and if we start embracing what needs to be done how we can contribute to making a community better for any level i think we can just make the world a better place i leave you with this parting thought and thank you so much